So, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to panel two in hall number two. And this not after two o'clock, but after three o'clock, after hopefully a delicious lunch at a difficult time. And therefore, it is a difficult subject that we have to discuss. And I am very pleased that you have to decide. You have decided in favor of panel two. I would like to thank those who are here in the panel today. And I think that in the course of the one and a half hours, we will learn more about each other. And I don't want to introduce all of you in summary today, because we have one and a half hours time. Uh, but normally, this is not enough time, as we know from experience, that everybody gets enough time to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, similar to the first panel, we would like to begin with statements from the panel, uh, listening to questions from the uh, participants, and we would like to try to enter into a dialogue, not only with uh, with prefabricated statements, but to get along with a very important issue to us, namely, what if importance have and efficiency technology for the transport sector, but also for ensuring future energy supply. Can efficiency technology, in particular innovative drives, alternative fuels, telematics and communication technology, as well as new materials can they be the key to decarbonization, to minimization of CO2 emissions and traffic? What efficiency technologies known in transport today, that means to all transport carriers, road, air, and uh, water transport, but also for rail, which have the largest efficiency potentials? And where are the, is the greatest potential for success uh, in order to bring these technologies into the market? And how can we pave a way for these technologies quicker than we did so far and in the past to Pa to, to pass them on to the con uh, consumer from the head of the designer, the engineer, so that they finally arrive at the shop. And what instruments can we use? Uh, subsidy of uh, research work, taxation, levies, market-based instruments such as emissions trading. Should we set ourselves objectives? Uh, about the CO2 uh, reduction or efficiency gains. In all speeches which we have heard this morning, the speaker spoke of a decoupling of uh, economic growth, transport growth, and energy and land uh, 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 use. Could this decoupling of transport growth and growth of the energy consumption become a guiding principle of a sustainable transport poli uh, policy and top ma uh, maxim so that the increase, the rise, the angle in the growth will not be the same as the increase in energy consumption, the same angle. So these are very difficult questions we want to tackle this afternoon. And I think that we should discuss this afternoon about the question, are these the right questions which we ask? And where are the barriers, the hurdles, and also 
the barriers in the discussion process between all of us and it would even be, be better if we arrive at solutions how to overcome these barriers. But ladies and gentlemen, please be so kind and uh, name, identify the controversies. We are not here in order to push around uh, cotton balls. We are not here to tell each other nice things. But the expectation is, and it is also the expectation of our children and our grandchildren, that we find solutions together, and this is difficult enough. So therefore, I'm looking forward to our discussions this afternoon. And I have here, or we have with us, Professor Julia King. And I'm extremely pleased that you, in an outstanding report about the potential chances and the technical possibilities for CO2 reductions in road transport, you have prepared analysis and made proposals that impressed us in Germany very much. We can only underline what you say in your King Review. This is a royal report, and in 2004, in our fuel strategy uh, implemented by uh, uh, issued by the federal government is similar. This report is an encouraging signal to policy and to companies and also to science that in the development of efficiency technologies, we can even invest more and be successful. And therefore, I would be very pleased if you, Professor King, could briefly give us an insight into what you describe in your report or in the first workshop in panel number one, what you said there in panel number one. Perhaps this could be a very interesting uh, beginning for all of us. Professor King, you have the floor. Thank you very much. The English uh, booth has no, uh, it doesn't get the original. So we have to wait. German is okay. German is okay. Please try again. Please try the microphone again. Please try the microphone again. Sollen das andere Mikro rübergehen? Ja. Ja, das ist jetzt in Ordnung. Ja, jetzt können wir Sie hören. Recht vielen Dank. Ich denke, wir hatten eine sehr lebhafte und positive Diskussion in Panel an. Und es war eine sehr unterschiedliche Gruppe von Panelisten. Dazu gehörten Vertreter aus der Autoindustrie von Toyota und von VW und auch Vertreter auch von NGOs, von der Wissenschaftsszene und aus anderen Gebieten. Also das war ein sehr unterschiedliches Panel und wir haben, denke ich, sehr starke Schlussfolgerungen gezogen und es gab überall vorsichtigen Optimismus und 30-prozentige Verbesserung in der Autoineffizienz, in der Entwicklung von Optimierung von konventionellen Technologien, also Technologien 
Technologien, die es heute bereits gibt. Das ist da, die werden wir auch in der Nähe, in der, in der Zukunft haben, aber nur, wenn wir den historischen Trend aufnehmen können, also besser werden in der Zukunft, dass wir das Ganze besser aufgreifen. Also wir müssen keine immer stärkeren äh, Motoren machen, zum Beispiel, wir können einfach besser werden, 30 Prozent besser als jetzt, das wäre auch kosteneffizient für den Konsumenten, aber so, wie wir uns verhalten und wie wir in der Zukunft zum Beispiel äh, Kraftstoffe einsparen werden, dafür brauchen wir natürlich auch politische Anreize, dass wir die entsprechenden Autos dann kaufen wollen. Der technologische Fortschritt, der wurde insgesamt angenehm, dass der bis äh, 2030 äh, sowohl äh, in die Richtung der Plug-in-Hybride geht und bis 2050 zu den Elektrofahrzeugen. Und es war eine äh, überwiegende Mehrheit der Meinung, dass es Elektrofahrzeuge geben wird. Aber es gab auch die Mö Möglichkeit der Brennstoffzelle. In der Zwischenzeit haben wir auch die Frage der Kosten diskutiert, insbesondere auf die Hybride. Und da äh, waren auch die Autohersteller der Meinung, Uh, so far have suggested indeed more positive than, than the Stern review is and more positive than I think the more recent McKinsey Vattenfall analysis. Uh, a feeling that we were probably looking at costs with, with, with some industry cost reduction in place of around 3,000 euros per vehicle and that actually uh, this in terms of escalating fuel prices this didn't look like uh, such, a big, uh, such a big step. A real need, however, for R&D investment in battery technologies, and I would say a strong message there to the Framework 7 program that we could do with uh, more focus on, on batteries. Uh, and a concern raised that actually biofuels may end up being uh, more costly than many of the automotive developments. And indeed, we need to recognize Jack Giacometti's comment from Shell earlier today, uh, recognize that the scale of the biofuel industry may not be so extensive uh, and be realistic about our expectations in the proportions of biofuels. However, the automotive industry does need to know what ministers are going to do about the power industry because huge savings potentially available from electric vehicles are entirely dependent on the power industry. And a, a very good example was quoted of an electric vehicle which would have effective emissions of about six grams per kilometer in Sweden with their current power generation, but 120 grams per kilometer in Greece with their current generating mix. And the car industry cannot be expected to be responsible for the decarbonization of the power industry. It needs a strong signal from governments that that is going to happen. And so it can also focus on these electrification technologies in the safe knowledge that they will be the technologies to deliver benefits. A fuel economy standard was strongly supported by everyone around the table, including our automotive colleagues, uh, both now, but also with future signals to give a, leving, a level playing field, as Mr. Hodak commented this morning. And also the issue of better standard drive cycles came up, recognizing that some of the new technologies and some of our increasing knowledge about where in our driving most CO2 is emitted need to be reflected in the way we rank cars. So I think we had a very positive session uh, with a, a number of, of useful points coming out. Thank you. Dear Mrs. King, thank you very much. This was a very interesting statement that sounds to be banal, but which is of great importance. It is not worth in the discussion about new technologies to pick out one sector only, but there is an interlacing that causes an integrated approach, an integrated approach and an integrated view of the pros and the cons. This morning and 
today at lunchtime the distance between tank and plate between production of fuels and production of food played already a role and you among others raised the question what about the energy generation uh, in the upstream of the truck and the passenger car which is an important idea uh, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, two gentlemen, Mr. Augustine and Mr. Duval, will be given the opportunity now, I think, to give their opinion, to tell us what they think about it, and that we make a first break then, so that we are here in the panel, but perhaps also with you, the audience, discuss what we have heard. Until then, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Peter Augustin, who is uh, in the CEO of Zab, and with his own firm, he deals with the prospects of success for efficiency technologies and their con contribution to cost reduction and energy saving. The automotive industry, Mr. Augustin, has already been mentioned. So, what is the situation with the efficiency technologies? What pro do we have with the diesel technology, with the petrol uh, cars, new drive combinations? What are the fields you see where we can expect, expect success and where are the hurdles? So what is the situation for the future? Sorry. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for, for that question. Uh, now, uh, I would be very glad if I knew all the answers. I have maybe some ideas after spending 30 years working in the automotive industry. Uh, there are quite many very interesting comments given so far in this conference and uh, I really appreciate uh, all comments from different industry and politicians. Uh, there are a couple a couple of things that, that I would like to point out and a couple of comments that, uh, on things that I think that we haven't really discussed enough on this conference. Uh, first, if you look into technology, I'm, um, I'm an engineer actually, I started work 30 years ago and, and in a way this is a kind of a déjà vu experience because I got into the Technical University in 1973 after that oil, uh, you know, the oil situation we had at that time. Uh, and then I spent 30 years working in the automotive industry uh, and then I wonder what did we do with that 30 years. Now we're back at the same point in time, talking about uh, higher oil prices and more efficient solutions and so on and so forth. So 30 years has, has gone and, and still the same situation seems to be there now even more, more urgent. Uh, I'm, as I said, as an engineer, I think that the solution is a lot to do with technical and the technical development. And I'm very optimistic there. Um, three points if you look into, I talk mainly now automotive car sector. Weight reduction, as uh, was talked about a lot yesterday, weight reduction is very, very important. Um, if one reduces weight, you can also, of course, reduce size. But if you reduce weight, uh, usually also you add cost to a vehicle. And that is something that we have to deal with. We need to have reduced weight, but we also need to reduce cost. And that is, of course, a challenge. And, and I'm focusing a lot now, actually, on, on technologies that could also reduce weight, but also reduce cost, because we need to have both enabled to, to move forward. Then one thing that I think that we haven't talked about enough here, we talk about solutions like hybrids, electric cars, and so on for the future. There's one thing that I would like to point out. There is a lot to do with the combustion engine, today's combustion engine, and we haven't talked a lot about that. We need to develop the combustion engine into the combustion process, so to speak, into the engine now. And there are quite a lot of technologies that you see within the automotive, uh, but also outside the automotive uh, uh, industry that could help there. We cannot deal with this without developing the combustion and whatever fuel we are running with. Then on, on biofuel, um, I, uh, I actually, a few years back when I was CEO of Saab, decided to go into biofuels on Saab in Sweden, mainly for market reasons, 
Today, Saab is selling 80% of their cars in Sweden with biofuels, ethanol. You could argue is that the right thing, but it has really turned the head into these customers. They will not buy a non-environmental car after they have bought one environmental car. Final two points from my side. Uh, the government has a very important role. I believe a lot in uh, that there has to be policies taken, policies given. Industry is very, very competent. Industry can adjust. Industry needs guidelines that are without competi competition differences. So, so politicians have to take firmer steps. And then there is another final point that we haven't discussed either. The automotive industry is heavily invested into today's technology. Today's technology will last for 10, 15 years if you go into powertrains. We haven't addressed that either, but that's part of the challenge, of course, because you're sitting with a lot of capacity, a lot of investment that you have to deal with before introducing new technology. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. August. And in five minutes, you at least opened a wide horizon. What can be possible? But of course, it's a very exciting subject which you have thrown into the discussion. To what extent it's now up to politicians, whatever instruments they might use, to promote such a process and to influence such a process. And according to my experience, the difficulty is already that uh, the public uh, money may also be spent wrongly. So processes and technologies might be subsidized, which actually do not lead us into the future. And yet they are being promoted because there is such a subsidy, because it's a tax relief, because there is just a regulation which provides for it. So obviously the state has to take a very play a decisive role together with the industry and together with science. And that's why I'm very pleased is that Mr. Duval has come here from the U.S. as a representative of his government. We know each other uh, from our uh, meetings and I know he's an excellent, uh, he knows excellently the traffic and transport politics and since we are uh, discussing very intensely about this subject, sometimes even a con having a controversial discussion. I would like to ask you how, what possibilities do you see to, for the state to influence this development? And just to mention one problem, there is a market-oriented instrument, which however is not the car, uh, but it's focused on the aircraft, and you know this is was this was one subject, and it's uh, emission trading. This is a very market-oriented ins uh, instrument, and now all presidential candidates have taken a positive view on that. We had the Warner Act also, so there is something going on. Now also let us. Uh, get the Americans on board in this sense as well. So what is your opinion? What is your opinion about state intervention? What are the possibilities of the state up to the emission trading for air traffic? So what do you see from the point of view of the United States? Thank you, Minister. Uh you said to be controversial, right? So, uh, no. Um, the, the, obviously, in the United States, this is a growing, uh, important debate. I'm definitely not going to comment on the uh, presidential campaign uh, back in the U.S. That would be beyond controversial. I'd probably lose my job on the spot. So, uh, I, I will what not a pity. <laughs> I will not be doing that. But I think it's pretty clear that uh, obviously this this question, particularly in the transport sector, is one that has received huge attention. We we in the, at the department uh, have just pursued uh, the most sweeping fuel economy regulation in, in U.S. history. Uh, in April, we put out a notice of proposed rulemaking, a regulatory proposal that would basically mandate a 25 percent increase in fuel economy for the uh, model years 2011 to 2015. And our view uh, is consistent with, the, with Dr. King's that uh, the technology is available. Uh, we've been in a performance versus fuel economy race, and performance is won uh, in the United States, probably more than any other country in the world. Uh, that's been true. We've had a huge increase in horsepower in our car market uh, and, our, and a huge move towards uh, uh, 
uh, sport utility vehicles in the United States, and we have now announced this, this, is the, this would be the third increase, but the most sweeping increase uh, in fuel economy requirements uh, we've ever done. Uh, the auto industry, uh, as Dr. King mentioned, I think accepts that this is feasible. Uh, the costs are substantial, and we estimate that the cost will exceed $40 billion. Uh, so I, I saw the chancellor quoted uh, Milton Friedman when she said there's no such thing as a free lunch. There were other great Americans quoted earlier, but uh, that was a good quote, and it's true. This, it's going to be expensive, but I think in our view, both from an environmental and an energy security standpoint, the, the U.S. car market has got to su substantially improve fuel economy, and, and, and as as Peter said, it really is a, we've got to unleash the technology forces that have moved for performance uh, into fuel economy. And so I think it's an extremely aggressive proposal. I can't get into talking back and forth with folks because it's an open comment period for the public right now, but I would encourage you all to read it. And it's an open docket. You're free to submit comments to the United States government about whether you agree with the proposal. But uh, I think as a global matter, it's unquestionable in the, in the view of the United States that technology is the answer, but the market incentives have to be there, obviously, to supply the technologies we're pursuing a huge government expenditure program to pay for technology development and R&D, uh, but there's little question, obviously, that the marketplace is going to need to commercialize these technologies. As I think President Nixon's uh, quote uh, this morning was indicative of, we've talked about these promises for many, many years, uh, and I, th I think there is a, a tipping point that we've reached right now. Obviously, high oil, oil prices are driving significant behavioral changes even today. We just announced last month that vehicle miles traveled in the United States had declined on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, we continue to grow as an economy. The first quarter GDP number was up 0.9% which is not great, but we continue to grow, but we are seeing a decline over the last 18 months in vehicle miles traveled in the United States. So I'm not, it's unclear whether that's a permanent break, but uh, clearly travel uh, patterns are changing in the U.S., and I think our view is that's a, that's a, that's a good sign. Uh, we can talk about other technology things in the, in the rest of the session. But. Thank you, Tana. I think these were three very interesting aspects. Uh, the question of an integrated approach, the question of new drive techni techniques and fuel technologies in the automobile industry and the requirements to the politicians to support this move with, with whatever, whatever instruments they might use. And also it was a clear statement that in the international context we have to find these solutions and that awareness in the US, in Asia, and in Europe is equally growing in the sense that we have to do something. Now, after this first half hour, I wanted to give you a chance to uh, ask some questions from the public, from the auditorium, uh, maybe some questions of understanding, maybe some statements to uh, get yourself involved into this discussion. Maybe we, are, we should just focus on the keywords politics, automobile, but of course feel free to ask other questions and to tackle other areas as well. And I think then we could continue with the statements from the panel. There is one person asking for the floor. Please, would you mind uh, introducing yourself? expert in eco-driving. My question is for uh, both Mr. Duval and Agresson. My first car was a Saab, a 96, 42 horsepower, top speed 125, weight 810 kilograms. If I want to buy a Saab today, I buy at least 150 horsepowers and uh, at least 1500 kilograms and a top speed always over 200 kil uh, kilometers an hour. Uh, this upgrading is, I think, one of the most serious problems that we should address. ECMT has addressed this issue already in 1991 in the ministerial where a resolution was accepted on reducing power and speed. Since then, nothing has happened. It was the other way around. All uh, issues like I mentioned, power, speed, uh, interior size, dimensions, have been upgraded. And my question is, would the car industry um, oppose any kind of regulatory um, limiting uh, specific power weight uh, ranges and ratings uh, so to help overcome your marketing priorities because you are selling power and performance even more vigorous than fuel efficiency still uh, in these days. 
And it was Mr. Gillenhammer of Volvo who addressed that ministerial in 1991, telling, I would agree and accept a limit to power and speed, but only when that is an equal level playing field. By governments, would you support such an approach for today? Yeah, I mean, I think, our, again, our view in the United States is rather than regulating performance with prescriptive regulations, it's better to regulate what you're trying to achieve, which is fuel economy and greenhouse gas reductions. And so we, we regulated fuel economy and, and did it in a way that allowed manufacturers to basically continue to manufacture a broad array of vehicles, uh, obviously subject to consumer preferences. The cost of the rule is obviously driven uh, by the current state of consumer preferences. So if consumer preferences change, which there are some signals in the United States that that's happening as we speak, uh, obviously the cost of the rule will decline and automakers will uh, respond to changing consumer forces uh, by making more fuel efficient vehicles without a regulation. But our, our view is the regulation should be tied to fuel economy. It's a, it's a mandate. It's a government mandate. One, one point I didn't mention, Minister, was that we also allow trading uh, both across companies and within firms uh, across the SUV market or the light truck market and the car market within companies and across companies of credit. So the mandate applies to your entire fleet. Uh, obviously, if you over comply, you can then trade your credits to to other firms, so yet to see whether the, the auto companies in the United States were not very supportive of that notion, but it was we insisted on that uh, as an additional flexibility tool to lower costs. Uh, so we'll see, but I think there are a wide variety of ways in addition to horsepower reduction, obviously, to achieve fuel economy, and I think our view is to pr provide flexibility to the manufacturers to pursue all those different approaches on a technology-neutral way. That is, that is a good, a good signal. Um, That's a good signal. We agree, obviously, that we have to set certain targets. We agree that we need such targets. This is, of course, a very important finding. We are not 100% in agreement what the targets are going to be, and we are even not uh, in agreement about the scale and the way these targets should be set, and only then we can discuss how to achieve these goals together. But it's of, of a very important finding that across the uh, different branches, across every, all the people who are discussing here, there is a consensus that we need these goals and we need an agreement about how to achieve them. But maybe, Mr. Morin, may I also um, address you later on? to get the view of an automobile supplier uh, to the automotive industry. But first, Mr. Augustin, please. You bought a Saab, the first one I got. Uh, if there were biofuel now, you could, you could run on, on Saab. I would like to answer the two, in two. One thing you can say from a small Swedish automotive manufacturer that once produced cars for the Swedish, you can say, family market. Uh, that would not be possible today because of the, you can say, European construction. That's why Saab has gone up, enabled to sell a lot of cars in the U.S. and so on and so forth. So that's one reason. But I remember in the 80s when I worked for Volvo, actually, we, we, we worked with a very strict California emission laws. Very difficult to achieve them, but we did. Secondly, we worked with a very, very tough safety regulation coming out from U.S. as well. We fixed that as well, and uh, I would say that the industry will respond to brave politicians. Uh, but the last uh, couple of decades here, when it comes to fuel efficiency, there hasn't been too many brave politicians. So I, I'm very, very positive in, in that respect, that the industry will, but it has to be competition neutral. Because if it's competition neutral, then it's of course the same playing field. Uh, Secondly, well, the last thing I would say also that, that Saab introduced turbos, only turbo engines in all cars a few years back as a tool. We saw that yesterday, that that could be one tool enabled to, to achieve better performance. But uh, oh, these are my comments on that question. Mr. Moridis, you are the CEO of Valeo, Valeo, one of the most important automobile suppliers. And I think this question could be very interesting to you as well. The question was, which was just asked to Mr. Augustin. It is too late, I think, in the, it is too late, I think, in the art of the subject. Uh, the fact is that we all want to have powerful car.
because we think that at some point we might need this power, but 95% of the time we don't need the power. We are running our cars utilizing probably 20 to 25% of the power that we have in the engine. So what is the solution? We have technically the solution. It's called the hybrid. Uh, the hybrid is that you have big electrical motors, one, two or three, and you have a smaller uh, thermal engine. But now the problem of the engine is that no one in the short and mid-term will ever make money with it. And it has been proven uh, some car manufacturers are making hybrids, but I do not believe that they are, this is a good economic model. Now, are there alternatives in between the hybrid, the full hybrid, as it is known, and the current gas engine? Certainly, there are many, many solutions. There is not such thing as a free lunch. May I repeat the sentence? It's perfectly true, and we will have to accept the idea that we need to pay for that. We need to pay for lighter cars. This is not my part. This is your. Uh, and as well, we we'll have, we'll have to pay for further technologies. What can be those technologies? Point number one, basically every component in the car can consume less energy. The air conditioning compressor can help by 3 or 4 percent if we know how to have a lighter product, how to have a product that takes less energy for the, uh, from the engine. If we regulate the temperature of, of the engine in a better manner, we can save 4 to 6 percent. By the way, when I say 4 to 6 percent, we need to realize that I'm talking about 8 to 10 grams. This is massive. Right? I'm not talking about small numbers. Uh, you realize that Michelin with the green tires saves three grams. So I'm just with one small product like the radiator, I'm talking about three times more. So it's very important. Talking about the transmissions, replacing those uh, heavy automatic transmissions by dual clutch transmission could save as much as 10 percent. And here comes as well the micro hybrid. What is the idea of the micro hybrid? It's very simple. It just says that Every car that it stops shouldn't pollute. I think it's very understandable for all of us that we get to pay an environmental price for what we do. I want to go from A to B, there is a price to be paid for that. But when I am still, when I don't move, why should I pollute? So the idea is just turn off the engine. Unfortunately, you cannot turn off the engine and restart them each time. We need special technologies to do that. This is what Valeo has done. This is now available on some cars on the market. I hope that soon it will be on most cars on the market. This is just a first duration. You can think this is just a reversible motor, right, that starts the car each time that it is needed, and when it doesn't start the car, it recharges the battery. Just imagine for one second, that in the second generation, you can take the energy from the deceleration and put it into ultra caps. This adds a further 5%. That means that just with that product in towns, one could save as much as 30% of gas emissions. And 30%, we are talking now about 50 to 60 grams average on a car. This is, again, a very big number. Today, our experience is that in towns, this is 23 to 28 percent of savings, and utilizing the standard computation in Europe, this is 6 to 8 percent. So very, very significant numbers. I believe there is a very interesting road here going to the mild hybrid, which will have a booster effect, so we can downsize the gas engine and increase the size of the electrical engine without going toward the full hybrid, which, as, as I said, is not profitable. If a model is not profitable, no one will go for it. We are, all of us, here to make money. I'm sorry to say, uh, to, to be very busy. And therefore, we need to find profitable models. I've mentioned this morning as well the electrical car as a, uh, an alternative. I think it is a very interesting alternative. It is true that the gas engine, though, has demonstrated only a little portion of the efficiency that it can have. If you add the technology of camless, for example, you might well reach 50% of further efficiency as compared with what it is today. So we shall not be uh, negative. I think we have to be very proactive. We have to be very optimistic. The whole question is all this is very costly in terms of developments very costly in terms of cost per unit. I'm talking about 2,000 to 4,000 euro per cars. And if we don't do that on all cars, why should some people buy more expensive cars while others will privilege maybe more comfort 
or as I said this morning, music in the car and not buy those uh, green, greener cars. So this is why regulation might be as important than technology at the end of the day. Sorry, I was very long. Thank you very much. When one listens to you, one thinks that we will indeed see the perpetuum mobile uh, in the next 15 years. All energy which we need, which we have to put into our drives, will be regained and recovered so that we really can drive endless ways. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say thank you to our interpreters up there in the booth, but we had a very complicated presentation with many technical terms, and it's a miracle to me how people can talk about chemless drives and injection pumps and what well, and diesel and uh, auto and, and combustion engines. How you can be uh, ever translate all this into this Babylonian uh, questions into another language? So thank you for that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there, is there any other question which we might ask from the audits? Uh, we leave it to this lady uh, who she wants to give the mic to. So, would you mind? Uh, I just would like to build on the earlier question about lighter cars, because somehow Mr. Augustin was referring to it already. All the measures that have been mentioned, I'm, I'm totally enthusiastic about to reduce uh, to improve efficiency, but at the same point in time, I like cars, don't get me wrong, but it's somehow funny to transport a 75 kilogram person in a 1500 kilogram vehicle. I'm doing it myself. So somehow I think it, it must have to do with marketing. It's not just that the consumer wants to have an SUV. They were told it was safer. If you go the other way around, you can argue, I, I think you can do a marketing campaign where you explain to people that a lighter car is much more fun to drive, handling gets better, etc., etc. So people start to pay more for a lighter car. Um, Mr. Augustin, perhaps you're in the best position to answer that. Maybe I would leave another question. Uh, uh, this was actually not in favor of uh, getting all less weight or losing weight for all of us. I think you want cars to lose weight. Maybe uh, Mr. Uh, we leave another question over there. Uh, I think it's been a very interesting discussion. Uh, this, I'm Lou Fulton with the International Energy Agency, and uh, uh, we've heard a lot about some of the technology opportunities. We've also heard that technology is expensive, and, and, and it's true, and it's going to cost money to make these cars more efficient, and we've heard numbers like 3,000 euros a car. I don't think we've really heard enough this morning, though, this afternoon, about one of the key benefits of this, which is fuel savings. And by our calculations and some of the recent work that the IEA has done, uh, even at $60 a barrel of oil, if you uh, estimate the fuel savings using a social cost approach, which means most of the travel that the car does over, over its life, which I think social cost is the right way to look at this in the climate change context anyway, you will save easily 3,000 euros worth of fuel on an average vehicle. So for the, for the consumer and for society, this is either a zero or a near zero cost proposition on net. And I just wanted to say that because I don't want us to walk away thinking that it's all cost and no benefit. At $130 a barrel of oil, I think the numbers look really good, whether it's uh, social cost or private cost. But I'd be happy to hear any comments about that. In particular, I'd be curious about how the U.S. handled the fuel savings in their recent uh, legislation. Vielen Dank. Herr August. Thank you very much, Mr. Augustin, then Mr. Duval, and after that I would um, like to switch to the next carrier, and that would be the railway, which is a, a carrier which certainly is a true alternative to the road. And But first, Mr. Augustin. That, that was addressed here. When I grew up, I was going with my mother and father in a uh, Volvo, 444, you know, and then I, my first car was a Beetle and your first car was a Saab. All of us, we were driving in small cars, we were riding, and it was, it was okay from a size viewpoint. Of course, the size of cars has grown. grown. And then, of course, the, the, the question about safety has also uh, had a big impact because the bigger car, the safer it has to be, the heavier it will be as well. But then coming back to, to the question about material, aluminum and high-strength steel. 
But if you add aluminum, you have also to have a better design so you can take out cost because aluminum is more costly than, than the steel that you are replacing. High strength steel is very important, but then you have to have a manufacturing technology so that you can produce these vehicles and sheet metals, parts, as efficient as before. And if you can have that, and I see that, I work with people today that has that technology. And then, of course, then it's a definition of what size of a car you should have. But you can have a lighter car, and of course you can uh, have a smaller car as well. So that's more of, of, of customer demand, but also regulation. I would also say here, uh, as we haven't talked too much, and I would like to repeat that, we have to go into the combustion engine, the combustion process, because then uh, I work with people that has, I've seen now technology, that can dramatically reduce fuel consumption on the combustion system. You don't need to add a hybrid, or you add a hybrid to a much more efficient combustion engine. And that, there is much more to do in that area, because then you can downsize the engine, and you can downsize the cars, because you don't need as big or heavy car as well. Thanks. As to the uh, marginal cost, mar marginal benefit question, absolutely, the, uh, the marginal benefit Marginal cost ratio was about 1.5 1, 1 to 1 in our rule. Uh, and no question, that I think 90, 90 plus percent of the benefits are driven by fuel savings. The, the, actually, the greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction benefits are a relatively small percentage of the total benefits uh, in the rulemaking. But the, you're 100 percent right. We, we don't do rules that are not cost beneficial as a policy matter. And uh, that, that was the driving force of the rule. The other to respond really quickly to this point, though, that there is substantial concern in the United States. We have 43,000 people die on our highways every year, uh, which is a number that has declined on a, on a per VMT basis, but is still an extremely high number that has not declined on a total basis uh, appreciably in recent years. And uh, uh, there, the National Academy of Sciences that looked at this exact question basically found a, a significant correlation between on the passenger car side, not necessarily on the SUV side, but on the passenger car side, a significant correlation between uh, fuel, uh, basically straight increases in fuel economy, which is why our rule is a much more creative approach in our view, but straight increases in fuel economy leads to significant increase. Uh, it's two to three thousand was the number of fatalities that the National Academy estimated. So, uh, if you, what we want is technology incentives. We don't want incentives necessarily just to make smaller cars, as a general matter, in, in the U.S. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. For a moment, we leave the road and the passenger cars and the trucks and the new driving systems and fuels. And we would like to go to other transports. This is rail and ship. Mr. Medorn, you are the chairman of the board of the German rail operator Deutsche Bahn. And nothing changes with the railways, with the rails. Everything remains as it has been a long time ago. An iron big machine is set on the rail and then it moves. There's no steam anymore, but there's diesel and electric power. My question is, what are the new innovations, something that can make the railway more efficient? And on the other hand, how do we get this shift from the road to the rail? Is it efficient? Is the euro better used on the rail? Well, first of all, I fully agree with you that the investment cycles of the railway are much longer than for passenger cars or other means of transport. We have trains with a life expectancy of 25 to 30 years. Some even have a longer life. And we also have to see that in some long, such long cycles, the innovation speed and the long-term investment is reduced. But anyway, as far as the railway operator is concerned, there are many possibilities to be innovative. This has something to do with money, of course, and it has to do a lot with how you operate uh, the, uh, the system, the rail system, and you know that that 
we uh, stick to the transport philosophy that it is not important to see the rail before the truck or the car, but in modern transport we know that both we need the truck and the rail and that we can save a lot of money and can be innovative if we connect the two of them. That means that we do not only let people change uh, mo the mode of transport, but also containers from the truck to the rail or from the rail to the truck. And there are technologies, there is innovation that we have to use, and we have to underline the must, we have to. Because even if we would have all the money in the world, we would not have enough, enough space in order to build sufficient infrastructures, and the infrastructures have to be used more efficiently. So this is true of the rail, of the rail ports, which we are currently building in order to increase the speed of the change of the goods from the ship to the rail or to the road. The retention times or waiting times of the container should be as, lo as uh, short as possible, not to store them, but use uh, uh, intelligent systems, not only when the train or the truck is rolling, but the entire entire logistic process should be accelerated. Reliability, speed, and speed is time. These are decisive moments for our customers to make a decision in favor of our carrier. And uh, there is still a lot of innovative possibilities which we have. And I admit, we, the railway operator, do not implement it so aggressively as the automotive industry did it in the past few years, but now we have quite a number of innovations ongoing. I would like to uh, tell you that we in Germany at the railway operator since 1992 have measured the reduction and reduced the uh, emissions and reduced them by somewhat more than 20 percent, and the goals from 2004 were adopted to 2025, and we have set ourselves another goal of 25 percent reduction. We, uh, in my capacity as the, as the president of the European rail operators, we have transferred those goals to Europe, and we have the commitment of all European rail operators. Some still have to uh, think a bit and have to be pushed, but the commitment of all European rail operators to reduce their emissions by another 20 to 25 percent this means that there is pressure again, or the emphasis is on innovation in the rail systems. We do not only operate the rail, but also trucks. We are the largest forwarding agency with more than 40,000 trucks, and the same goals specified for the rail have also been taken over for Schenker, our uh, forwarding agency, and together we want to uh, reach the aim to reduce emissions because we do not want to be a world champion on one side only and uh, neglect the other side. Many things will be done, will be introduced. Some things are on ongoing energy recovery, for, our, for example. Our inner city uh, rail systems that uh, they are renewed in the cities, Frankfurt is completed, they only use half the electric power because the power gained during braking will be refed, recycled, and we also uh, uh, cut the power consumption by 50 percent. We have special programs and we uh, train our locomotive drivers to drive the locomotives uh, intelligently gently and we also measure it and if you do not measure these things they have no value 
in every locomotive, in every rail engine, this is done where we have a power meter and we pay a small incentive to our uh, railway engine drivers, the locomotive drivers, to see whether they saved it. But of course, they also have to adhere to the timetable. Excuse me when I'm a bit, perhaps a minute, a minute too long, but it is not only a matter of CO2 emissions, it's also a matter of noise. We are successful. And Germany is a densely built up country. And as far as emissions are concerned, we uh, set good models, we have good objectives and goals, but our noise uh, goals have not yet been reached. And noise is also a pollution, it's a nuisance, and people can't live with high noise levels, and we also need innovation in this sector. And we do a lot in this respect, special brake systems, these are only partial systems. We need better materials for sheep shielding for insulation. We must also be agreed that the vibrations should be reduced and uh, all this costs money, of course, but over the time when we really set our goals high enough, we will reach them. It is not only a matter of money, it's also a matter of setting priorities. What we really wish, and you also said it in your introductory statement, we uh, would wish that more universities, more research institutions should be interested in the rails. So everybody is interested in space research and the automotive industry also has no problem with, uh, in the field of research. But the old, the heavy railways, everybody said, let them go. So they have no sex appeal. So therefore, they are not interested in the research for the railways. So. Uh, it would be good if we get some more funds so that the research institutions would also be interested in us. When the money is there, the ideas will be born. But on the other hand, we also say we want to be innovative. For example, currently, together with the rail industry in Berlin, Brandenburg, we develop an alternative research a driving and testing system for fuel cells uh, driving systems. We know all of them, but everything what we have tested is not good enough for the rail. It is either too small or not good enough, so we have to approach it anew with the industry and have to ask the automotive industry, the truck and the bus industry, whether they can help us in this effort so that we really begin when these technologies, hydrogen and the fuel cell, when this is mature, that is not only mature for the car, but also for us for our big and heavy locomotives. So I could say a lot more, and but we promise to be brief. But anyway, I believe what you said, Mr. Minister, is very important. We need objectives, we need goals, and everybody has to work on his goals. The small, the big industries, the researchers, the, the operators, and so on. And those goals must be reachable, achievable, and we need the funds for it. And we also need the political support. Uh, I do not want to give the wrong impression here, but under your leadership, we have developed a master plan for logistics in Germany. We never had that before. We would need uh, something similar for Europe as a whole, so that all transport carriers are or would be put together in a strategic plan. We know that many things in it are wishful thinking. This is very uh, expensive. Everybody knows you, you or we want the money. But we have to know what we need, the roads, the rail the air transport, and then our objectives and plan can, plans can be uh, uh, matched to it. And I think we are making good progress in this respect. Let's Thank you, Mr. Maidon. Uh, it is interesting, I think, that the old railway is an object of technological research and will have to be the more in the future. And that besides the question of energy efficiency, energy saving, renewable energies, we have heard with regard to the car, that means the ecology, fauna, flora, climate. Another aspect is coming to the discussion, life quality, no 
it's health protection, health protection for the people. And I think that this is not only an important challenge, but it is also an object for research. We have to be better to reach a game, uh, goals earlier. And now I look at the representative of the shipping industry. The, he is the chairman of the International uh, Shipping Federation. Mr. Polemis, with shipping, it is also such a fact that it is not so much in the focus as far as climate and new technologies are concerned, but in the meantime, you use very big sales and you deal with sulfur in heavy oil. So what are the new ideas, new technologies in the future to make a contribution to climate protection and to increasing the quality of life? Thank you, uh, uh, Your Excellency. Um, I'd like to start by echoing the words of uh, Jack Short this morning, uh, who made a very good presentation and then he put things into proper perspective. Uh, uh, and then, of course, he added that we need to work together. And then the session that followed, uh, was, I, was very, I was greatly encouraged because all of the ministers and all of the industry representatives agreed that this, we should be working together. It, it makes a lot of sense. This is something that, uh, uh, Minister, I have been trying for at least for the last two years to impress upon government officials uh, around the world uh, without uh, a lot of success, unfortunately. And this is something which I, I would like to uh, put to you and to your fellow ministers, uh, that there is not enough consultation with industry uh, so that we are more effective in the regulation. Because we are not against regulations, but we are against bad regulations. We want good regulations for shipping as I'm sure that other industries want good regulations for their own industries. Of course, when you talk about uh, <clears throat> uh, shipping, we, we jump from the 45 uh, horsepower engine to the 45,000 horsepower engine. So we're talking about a very different scale. Also, shipping is probably the, uh, uh, the, the most global industry there is because by the very nature of shipping, ships have to go around the world to transport goods, and that is what they have to do. It's not a question of choice. Shipping is also by far the most carbon efficient form of commercial transport. Uh, of course, we, we are responsible for carrying 90%, over 90% of the world's uh, goods, which means that we, we do realize and we do accept that we do have to play our part, and which, of course, we have been doing over the last few years. Uh, and I would say, as some ministers have told me, rather quietly, uh, there has been a quiet revolution because not so many people realize the efficiencies, uh, the, efficient, uh, the improvements in efficiencies that we have achieved. We're talking about maybe 20% over the last 10, 20 years. Um, and of course, because shipping is global, we do need global solutions. Uh, otherwise, uh, competition is going to be distorted. And I think that areas such as Europe are going to lose shipping altogether because shipping is going to move uh, away from uh, Europe. Uh, ICS, which um, uh, represents the collective position of uh, the world's national uh, ship owners associations from some 40 nations has been very active over the years in all of these issues that we have been discussing. And I'd like to uh, 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 break down into three sections. One is what we, have been, what we have done in the past, what we are doing currently, and what we are doing for the future, and what we're discussing on doing for the future. As far as the past is concerned, I have already mentioned uh, that uh, there has been an improvement in efficiency uh, of consumption primarily in engines as well as ship design of something like 20%. Um, 
The, uh, also, we have achieved uh, very recently, as you know, in uh, IMO, uh, the revision of MARPOL Annex 6, which means that there uh, has been a tremendous improvement uh, in the regulation of the fuel, the type of fuel that we can burn in the future, so that there are real uh, improvements in the uh, uh, sulfur emissions, NOx, uh, and uh, particular matter uh, in the immediate future. We're talking up uh, about the next uh, 12 years up to 2020, which is a very short time uh, uh, to achieve this. As far as uh, what we're doing currently, is that uh, we, ICS has uh, begun even before the debate, this was about two years ago, uh, the uh, discussion on CO2 uh, with uh, uh, their own um, uh, committee at ICS, which of course is an all-inclusive committee because we have invited outside participants, as we should. And uh, <clears throat> as far as uh, 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 the, the other uh, thing is that in order to assist the IMO in their work, the ICS uh, is coordinating two major international industry working groups which are examining mechanisms, both uh, regulatory and technical, that might be applied to existing ships uh, with their 25 year of uh, lifespan, as well as new ships. Now, as far as the future is concerned, in the medium term, uh, the current uh, assumption within the industry is that we will continue to be reliant on fossil fuels, as everybody has said. Uh, this means that immediate efforts are therefore being focused on reducing uh, fuel consumption. Looking, looking to the longer term, industry is also exploring more radical alternatives and nothing is currently ruled out. An obvious immediate solution is for ships to reduce their speed. An attractive option, uh, given the fact that fuel uh, is now uh, so expensive, but also fuel accounts for about 50% of operating costs uh, today. Uh, reducing carbon emissions is thus a matter of enlightened self-interest. Although attractive, of course, reducing speeds will presumably mean that more ships will need to be uh, employed to, provide, to, to carry the same quantity of cargo. The um, detailed studies are therefore needed uh, uh, to see what the net environmental benefits are. Given the role that shipping plays in our just-in-time economy, which is often taken for granted, slower speeds will also require cooperation from customers. There will be an impact on the inventories needed to maintain supplies of raw materials and manufactured products, and that the world economy needs to function. We also need improved efficiencies throughout the transport chain, including increased port capacity and improved hinterland connections. Together with shipbuilders and classification societies, the industry is exploring more fuel-efficient designs of engines, hulls and propellers, which combined with operational efficiencies might deliver average emission reductions of around 15% per ship by 2020. Whilst renewable energy sources such as wind and solar energy may have their place in helping to meet some ancillary requirements, such as lighting on, lighting on board ships. They are not currently practical for providing sufficient power to operate uh, the ships themselves, as far as the main engines are concerned. Nevertheless, the industry is actively investigating the use of such alternative sources and any other uh, means that we, we might be able to reduce uh, the consumption of oil. Finally, because I don't want to continue for too long, uh, fuel cells may be a possibility for the new ships in the very long term, although they are currently too limited in range to offer a viable solution. Thank you, Minister.
Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Surprising statements. Uh, what is going on and can be done in the sector of shipping in the future? And I would like to give Mr. Grundmann the floor now because, in the double sense, he's the right man now. On the one hand, he is a head of the mobility section with Siemens, with the firm Siemens, but I'm also interested in hearing his opinion as a former member of the Institute for space research in Berlin, if this is correct, if I'm well informed, as a somebody who wants to go into or looks into space or into the future. And I ask you the unusual question. When you have heard all that and you consider your research work, what your company, what Siemens is doing, so what will it be like in the year 2040? What will traffic be like that? Uh, of course, only on the rail. This is absolutely clear. It will be the railway system. It will be a rail, uh, uh, real. Know, real rail uh, system. Perhaps some people will be able to afford a plane, but uh, with cars and the fuel, this may be difficult in the future. So it is a shock when you come from the sector of research that you have to do with the rail. And I want to illustrate it and many things which you said, Mr. Minister, and my, what my colleague, colleague said is a very conservative business. I want to give you an example to make it clear for, from the side of the industry and to underline what you said. In California, we have a tram factory, a, a, a rail car fa factory, a tram factory, the last one in the U.S. Otherwise, there's only the cable car factory for San Francisco. And everybody who knows the USA and the tram market and the determination of the Americans to to drive cars, this factory is confronted with closing every year, and there's only the hope that it may change in the future. But everybody understands that this factory is absolutely clean. There are no surplus costs anymore. And therefore, there are only two types of tram. One type is a very light type of tram, and the other one is an old Duvac design with a very long mouth in the front and every car that's not or everybody who is not used to it could uh, would know that this tram can push every car from the street and now you can guess what tram will be bought it is this particular tram so what i want to say by that is what policy has to do as a, a priority you can subsidize it but first of all allow us to buy trams we need a market for and when I look at Mr. Schwarzenegger uh, in California, he somehow is successful. And he uh, is successful because he created the following uh, condition. He says, me, the state, the taxpayer, invests everything in the car equipment in all catenary, the other catenary, catenary cat catenary wire. and so the, the wire so mm. that this will be developed and the only thing that can be covered by the fair is the operation not more and this works nothing else works in the states and if we are honest also not in other countries and i am careful now but Last mes, uh, m month, I got an order for 77 new trams with very good margins. And now the people really go by tram. It is chic, it is modern. There is a change in consciousness and it is economical. And when we can sell trams, then we invest in trams and we deal with it or do it in uh, the U.S. in new drive system. And I think for us it would be most important to subsidize and promote the rail transport. Then we can sell it. This is the one side. And the other story is in London we did two, two businesses. 
we equip London with new city trains and then the toll, access, the toll access system was supplied by us in the second phase. Of course, every Londoner is angry that he has to pay so much money if he wants to use his car to go to the city center. But no longer now, we have we are saving 125,000 tons of CO2 emissions every year, and the Londoners are satisfied. The political determination, the political will, mass transport, uh, to me it is primarily the tram, then it is the time will be mature for that, and this will go on until 2040. Thank you very much for this very interesting. And now again, I give you the chance to intervene, please. This gentleman over there with the red tie into the red mic, please, <laughs> coming from behind. Now it's the yellow mic, which came first. Thorsten Beaker, Gelfe Kim. You mentioned uh, how you can put more goods from the truck to the rail. And it goes in the same direction as Mr. Grundmann's statement. There is a sentence that the last big adventure in Germany is the cross-border uh, cross traffic, rail. rail traffic. And there are many disadvantages in the rail uh, against the uh, street, and yet they go on for competition with the street. A street-born carrier who would have to do the same would actually not resist a year. That shows how efficient railway is. We have very major disadvantages we can which uh, if there are different uh, energy systems and different track width but there are also uh, gauges and there are also other uh, difficulties uh, an engine driver for instance has to have an um, a training in each country when we want to cross the border for the Benelux countries for going to Luxembourg or Netherlands the engine driver has to have three driver's license and he is um, uh, he has to speak each of the languages fluently and as a result the drivers can't be used efficiently and neither can't the the engines if you also want to when we speak about strikes of course you could respond much easier if you were flexible in using your drivers and politicians can do a lot about this about the international driver's license for engine drivers which allow the drivers to go everywhere which would be very helpful and one international language which would be used throughout Europe and that would help us to offer these services at much lower price and really compete with the road and to put more uh, goods on the railway and this would be very good for uh, if there was some help from the politicians side and you mentioned the international sky above Europe when we look at the railway system when we go from Brussels to Frankfurt it would mean that the machine would um, had to to go down between Munich and Aachen. Uh, then the, the the pilot and the aircraft would be exchanged, and then we could continue our flight. We are well aware that much lef is left to be done, but in the meantime, we managed to have this international driver's license for the engine drivers. But uh, liberalisation is not finished yet, and uh, you mentioned also that there are different standards in place which need to be harmonized, that includes the safety standards, European train control systems, etc. And it's a long way to go still. Thank you very much. There is another question now for the red mic. Um, let me ask my question in German. I'm Philippe Morgan. I'm the head of the Federmoda Gore, which is a French company, which makes cars for railways, which allow you to put a truck on the railway. So we work between France and Italy with eight trains per day, with uh, also between France and Spain. And I'm now addressing the German traffic mini transport minister. While we are now having projects in, in Poland, in the Netherlands, there is no op chance in Germany for such, even though Germany is actually the center of European transport. And the re reason is that there is no space for these good trains in Germany. We want to achieve that the trucks can go from France to Poland, from Berlin to Munich, and via Munich to Italy, but there is no technology, there is no technological solution available. There is a technological solution available. My factory has worked at it 15 years, 
Now there is such a solution, and we are working already between France and Italy. And it's very uh, bad that Germany uh, is actually not getting any benefit from this technology. I would like you to visit my stand outside and to give me your support a little bit because I could really transport uh, one to three million trucks on the trail. There is a lady in a white dress, in a light dress, I should rather say. Thank you very much. I'm Theresia Hackstein. I'm representing the uh, interior uh, shipping industry in Germany. And I also would like to get more transport on the water once we are talking about shifting trans uh, traffic. Shipping as a major carrier has some excellent properties. On the one hand, they get um, a potential on the waterways, also in the uh, as regards the fleet. Uh, so there is a lot of potential to take up more transport. We are also very energy efficient because uh, this is uh, it has been very widely discussed. And we talked about uh, fuels and oil consumption and uh, certainly there will be improvements to be seen in the future with some modern technology. And we are also environmentally friendly. Here too, internal or inland navigation uh, has some major advantages. And I would also like to point out uh, that the European Commission has made some proposals to reduce the sulfur content, which also led to an improvement of the CO2 emission or will lead to such a uh, reduction of CO2 emission. And inland navigation pro uh, proposed to do this in one go and uh, not in two steps like the European Commission has proposed. By the year 2009 we want to achieve this and we are strongly depending on the support of the Council of Ministers. And by the way, also in inland navigation there are some very interesting research programs going on which will certainly ensure that uh, ship design will change and this also get, is an enormous potential uh, for improving energy efficiency. I would also like to point out that not only the uh, railway is a good alternative with regard to this discussion, but because they have the potential in many ways. And this is what I want to um, include in your uh, conclusions, M Mr. Minister. Thank you very much. I don't know, Mr. Medon, you certainly have been quest asked as well. The technology is well known. How can we cooperate better, even, uh, especially with France? Maybe I can tell you something about in, uh, inland navigation. We love you extremely. Let me tell you this. Inland navigation is always suffering from the fact that they feel disadvantaged, but there is no reason to think so. We also use your uh, ships. We are extending the Duisburg sh uh, port. We are using the Rhine uh, transport. And we can't imagine our goods traffic without inter internal navigation. And I'm very um, honest in saying this. As we just listened, on the railway, we are also uh, running at the, at the edge of our capacities, and especially the now north south way has no free slots um, left. So we need infrastructural changes. We need building. We have a detailed plan of, about what has to be done. And we would need 17 billion euros for the next five years, which we don't have. And the capacity questions is actually very interesting. And uh, be quiet. We are also using your services. So I wish you all the best. Uh, um, you, uh, thank, uh, thank you for the uh, French intervention. Of course, your systems will only be good if you can go long distances. And uh, Germany is a transit country, and we are more uh, confronted with the subject that uh, trains have to cross our, uh, or traffic has to cross our country, north, south, and from Spain to the east, for instance. And we know this, and we also have uh, set up the rules of the game. We have to uh, give priority to international trains, priority over national trains, and that's the way we process these trains and these, this kind of transport. But of course, we are also facing difficulties about, uh, regarding the capacity, the available capacity, that is. There are some difficulties in cross-border traffic, 
and more than half of our trains are also crossing the border. And that, of course, is a question of the uh, timeliness of the trains. They are unfortunately not keeping to the time schedule as uh, strictly as our pas passenger traffic's, uh, traffic. Sometimes the good the freight trains come in two, three hours later and the slot has gone and then you have to wait for the next slot to open. So you have actually raised a very complex question. We are working on it. Uh, we believe that with our neighboring uh, railway systems we have to interlace much better, much better than the road uh, carriers. The railway systems work internationally not very well together. They are still too much oriented on their national borders. They are not so open to international uh, cooperation. But this is, of course, something which has to be done where they, where, by, the traffic, uh, by the railway systems themselves, where the railroad companies have to do their homeworks. And we mentioned uh, the technology. We have to use the same signals. We have to use this international driver's license. Uh, the European train control system is a major investment. Uh, we are all investing into uh, um, harmonized systems and I hope we will manage. In Italy there is already a system in place which we can't use with our trains. There the European system already comes to an end, stops to be European that is. So there is much left to be done and railways have to uh, cooperate much more. Thank you very much and I promise when there is time I will come and see your stand. Definitely. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, the time is passing very quickly. We have had a very highly interesting 90 minutes session. I wanted to come back to my initial statement that uh, uh, Julia King, uh, Prof, uh, Mrs. Professor King, uh, I want you to summarize your impressions very briefly and maybe you could really give us a very nice final statement. Thank you very much, Excellency. Uh, I think uh, it's, been a, uh, it's been good to hear a, a discussion which broadened out beyond cars because we came earlier on very focused on cars in this meeting and it's been very good to hear about the, the other, other transport modes. Uh, I think the, the main messages I've taken away is that, uh, let me start with, I think there's been a very strong message to our governments and our ministers about that we need an open Europe for transport uh, and we've heard this morning a lot about the benefits uh, of, uh, open, of, of European skies. Uh, and the, uh, we've also now heard, I think, about the benefits of, of open rail right across Europe. And, and you've said there are actions in there. Uh, and uh, I think so, so very much open Europe. Uh, and there are real opportunities for savings if we can make all of that happen effectively. I think we've also heard that, uh, that a message to our, our governments and ministers that, uh, that regulations are important and that all of industry uh, accepts that and they will help drive the, uh, the targets we need. But they must, be developed, they must be developed with industry. <laughs> Sorry, I, uh, uh, and they must respect competition. It was, I think, a very, a very strong message that came out. I think we've also heard uh, about the potential for innovation but innovation in its broadest sense. We've heard a lot about the potential from uh, innovation in technology, some very positive things uh, in the car area, uh, a very strong message about don't forget the, the conventional, what you might think are the conventional car engines. There is a huge amount of improvement still to come there from, from innovation. Uh, and we've also heard about uh, innovation in technology in, uh, in the other transport modes. But I think we've also had some interesting messages uh, about the opportunities for technology spillovers between one mode and another. We've heard about interest in fuel cells, uh, which may start small in cars. They may start small in APUs for aer airplanes that we heard this morning. But as those technologies are, are, can be scaled up, there is interest in the train sector, there is interest in shipping, uh, there is uh, interest right across the transport sector. So we must make sure that in our R&D thinking, and, and for example in European R&D funding, we're thinking about ensuring we make sure that knowledge is available right across all the sectors. We've also, I think, very interestingly heard a lot about the importance of innovation in operations. Uh, and sometimes innovation in operations is innovation that can reduce CO2 at quite low cost. So innovative thinking uh, and, uh, and innovation in infrastructure because actually being able to move rapidly between modes 
is a very good way of making use of the most CO2 effective modes and the most cost effective modes. So rapid movement between train and waterways, between, between, uh, between train and road, uh, for example. And I think coming from an academic background, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to say we've also, I think, had a message about um, the, uh, the amount of innovation we will need and the fact that we all really have a, an obligation to ensure we are inspiring and enthusing our young people about the importance of, of uh, working in some of these areas, the innovation right across all of these sectors, uh, and reminding them that perhaps it's not always aerospace and sometimes cars are the, that are going to be the way that they can help save the world. We also need them to be enthusiastic about uh, research at some of the, the, the new opportunities in, in, for example, rail and shipping. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor King for this very good summary. We have reached the end of this panel. May I thank you warmly for, to everybody first who have uh, taken place, uh, who have, uh, have uh, sitting here in the, in the panel and have had the very difficult task to answer briefly on very difficult questions and to uh, to be quiet about all those things which actually need to be said as well. I would also like to thank you for the attention. Uh, finally, I would like to tell you a very little story which may summarize what is the task for the near future. You know that in Germany some time ago we had the Einstein year, Professor Albert Einstein, who taught us uh, uh, and he taught his students every day to have, uh, he, he reached out a piece of paper with four questions which they had to uh, answer and he evaluated these answers. And one Monday a student comes up to Professor Einstein and says, Professor, you are actually really distracted. You gave us exactly the same piece of paper with exactly the same questions as uh, last Monday. And Einstein thought briefly and said, no, lady, you are wrong. Although these are the same, same questions, but I changed the answers. <laughs> it's the same question. For, it has been the same question for thousands of years to come from A to B, but what we need are new answers. Thank you very much.